In 1995, 40 people with type 2 diabetes in Miami, Florida, were walking around with an infusion bag 24-7 that contained a hormone that researchers and pharmaceutical companies hoped could set a new standard for diabetes medication. The hormone was GLP-1, which companies tried to convert into a medical drug without much success. In 1997, Novo Nordisk scientist Lotte Bjerre Knudsen managed to turn the short-lived GLP-1 hormone into a long-acting drug candidate. However, the initial test failed as the dose was set too low and the company could not immediately start a new trial. Because we'd used most of it and we couldn't get access to the factories. They were still only making insulin. People would say at the highest level in the company, there are three things you need to remember from our company and from this meeting. Modern insulins, modern insulins, and modern insulins. GLP-1 was never mentioned. Most of us thought it was a, it was a strange project. It was a different type of gut hormone uh, than the insulins that we know of. It was not a real drug uh, because it was so short acting that you couldn't use it as a drug and it had to be uh, changed completely in order for it to become a drug. So here came I, a very young uh, project manager and suggested that we should actually use some of the resources that were actually prioritized for insulin and use those on GLP-1 and and that was that was controversial. At the same time the toxicologist uh, came to us started saying you have some issues there's a hormone called calcitonin which is a marker of some cells called C cells up here in the thyroid gland that they seem to become overactivated we're starting to see a little bit of tumor formation and that also didn't make management happy. The findings were a surprise because... Nova Norisk were very careful to design a, a molecule that was as close as possible to human GLP-1 so as not to uh, activate the immune system and develop antibodies. Sometimes I call it a steak because it is made up by a small piece of a protein, a peptide, and then it's a natural fatty acid. So it's exactly the same components that there are in a steak. Despite the natural makeup, the findings on tumor formations in rats and mice now had to be taken seriously. We knew that this particular cell type that was the focus in the animals was probably not so relevant uh, in humans. But I think to Lottie's credit, the pursuit of the scientific truth is very important and certainly in the best interest of people living with metabolic disease. She funded work in our lab to see what the effects of GLP-1 are. They concluded based on their clinical evaluation that, or scientific evaluation that that was not relevant for humans. The alarm was finally called off. In 2006, the new drug reached the final and decisive phase three trial. We literally decided to design the most ambitious trial that was called the LEAD program. 3,800 trial participants in 42 countries on five continents participated in the phase three trials. However, despite great results, victory was far from assured. In the US, there's this public hearing that you often get put through uh, in a drug approval process, then the FDA has this independent advisory committee that they kind of discuss the findings. Several hundred employees followed the hearing in the USA on a big screen in hopeful anticipation. The meetings end with a committee voting on whether approval should be recommended. First, 
the leader of the toxicology area within the FDA, took the floor. They were saying, you know, you have cancer in two different species. And we weren't really given an opportunity to adequately explain why it wasn't uh, relevant. So it was uh, very dramatic. Each second, you, you can see the second ticking. It's like one minute per second, and, and you're like exploding. And then suddenly, ping, it gets up there, the vote. And the vote was split, meaning anything can happen. Luckily, there was soon a constructive dialogue between Dr. Mary Parks, Division Director, Endocrinology Products at the FDA, and Mertz Krogsgård Thompson at the company. And she said, we have to find a way forward together. And we said, we're extremely uh, eager to do so. Obviously, at that point in time, we were worried, you know, have, is this the end of uh, 10, 15 years uh, of work? So we kind of had to come up with the, with the burden of the evidence for why it wasn't uh, relevant for humans. Luckily, we were able to get a meeting where we could really in detail go through the data. What happened was actually amazingly that Mary Parks herself, together with a very high-ranking official in the FDA hierarchy, they write an editorial in the world's leading journal called the New England Journal of Medicine, where they actually show the data. And they did not see that this was an issue. We had been hoping before Christmas 2009 to get the approval, and then we had to wait into uh, January. One evening in January, Mads Krogsgård Thompson got the word that they might get the decision that night. Around 11.20 in the evening p.m., just before midnight, I'm sitting there, my family's gone to bed, I had small kids, just sitting, waiting, trying to concentrate on something else, but I couldn't, and the phone rings. It was US Head of Regulatory Affairs, Bob Clark, who called. And said, Mess, we got it. And I just go crazy. Yes! I almost like dance to dance, and I shouted. Yes! And uh, my wife came out and said, what are you doing? Come on, you're sleeping. Then I phoned my head of Global Regulatory Affairs and then we, we toasted on, on the telephone and congratulated each other and then I phoned Lotte. Who on earth is calling me at this hour? Okay, I, I picked it up. I had spent more than 10 years, uh, as sometimes as a lone female uh, warrior uh, and it was obviously really, 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 really big for me. I was, I was overjoyed. The wait was over, and Novo Nordisk decided to launch right away. So we didn't even um, have time to do all the uh, uh, advertisement materials. We were out in the market in a matter of days. That uh, had never happened before. The launch of the new GLP-1 drug became one of the best ever. But Lotta Biera Knudsen was not going to rest on her laurels. A remarkable experiment 15 years before still reverberated in the back of her mind. Researchers had observed a peculiar phenomenon in rats with tumours that were overproducing GLP-1. At day 17, the tumour was sufficiently large to make the animals completely stop eating. So we kind of knew that there was something with some of these peptides that was really important for appetite regulation. It was my dream from uh, 1995 that we could also pursue GLP-1 for obesity. But when we first proposed this to our kind of our marketing people back then, they said like, you can't have two biologies in one molecule. It's either diabetes or it's a weight loss. The commercial people did not see the light and the vision of GLP-1 because they were only thinking about insulin all the time. Management was also far from convinced. Previous clinical developments of obesity drugs had failed. Even some of them had led to cardiovascular death and lawsuits. It was not without controversy to try to develop an obesity drug. 